Welcome back to the Pickle Pulse. I am your host, Brian Green, and I'm here with the one and only Alex Pancake. What's up, Alex? Thanks for having me, Brian. Hey. Uh, life's good, man. 2024, we're here. That's right. Happy New Year. Same to you. First pod of the new year here on New Year's Day. That's right. You going to eat Black Eyed Peas? Black Eyed Peas? Is that a thing? You you don't know? You Okay. Where are you from? I'm from uh, right outside Raleigh. Okay, you're far enough south. You should know about Black Eyed Peas. Yo, I'm from Cary. People say Cary stands for the Centralized Area for Relocated Yankees. You know, we're, we're, we're not we're not southern. <laughs> so our southern tradition, for as long as I can remember, is you eat Black Eyed Peas for good luck on New Year's Day. Oh. So my mom did it, and my wife knew about it, and she's been doing it for us the whole time. And so yeah, we're gonna have um, it, it's some, something Susan. I don't know. It's got ham. It's got black-eyed peas. It's got spinach. It's really good. Oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, I got like five net cords that went my way today, so I don't know <laughs> if I need the luck. But. <laughs> <laughs> you were playing three fives there, right? Oh, no. <laughs> they're, they're bad. It was, it was like a good four or five play. It was good. Okay. It was good. Solid. Yeah. Solid. So Alex is joining us today because he is the founder and creator of Pickle Mart. It's an analytic company that I believe is mostly based online, all online? Yep, totally online. Okay. And um, I really wanted to talk to you, Alex, because I think that you don't have to be a pro level to want to look at analytics to get better. And um, so maybe just open it up to you in that how did you come up with the idea for this? You know, what's your background? Because if, if Brian Green does your analytics, it's going to be real poor. Uh, so kind of what's the story of Pickle Mart? Yeah, so taking even one more step back, I started playing about three and a half years ago. Okay. One of the COVID summers. Um, former tennis player. So like 2020, same as me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Out in, uh, out in Arlington, D.C. And then, you know, you play for fun, you play rec games. And like anything that I picked up, I want to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Like I've done competitive. I've done competitive Mario Kart, for God's sake. You no, know, you I'll take not. anything competitive. That's a thing? Is that for real? Oh, yeah. I mean, There's not much money in it, but it's a, it's a thing. My, where you get shot with turtle shells and it like ruins your thing and the the first place bombs and all that stuff. Too. Oh, dude, item probabilities. You got You got to understand that shit. <laughs> um, wow, next level Mario Kart. I'm gonna have you play my 15 year old. See if she can beat you. Easy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I got got really into it with pickleball, and it was Super Bowl. Not this past Super Bowl, but Super Bowl Super Bowl before that. Um, I was like, I want to break down my play. I want to get some data. Like, uh, in my full-time job, I work with data. Okay. I have a background in analytics. Um, so I was like, all right, like, what data is out there for pickleball? Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a ton. Uh, and I had some free time on my hands. I'm like, all right, like, let's start collecting it. Were you, like, watching Moneyball or something? And, like, wow, this is, <laughs> this, this is where it's going. Pickleball's going here. I think I was just frustrated with my own game. <laughs> I was like, why do I keep losing? Mm -hmm. Like, I, 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 you know, I... Most people know they have one or two weaknesses, but when you start quantifying them, like, all right, now you actually know what to focus on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to see how other people play, and there wasn't any data out there. So I was like, all right, like, let's start collecting it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it was just like a pet project where I would go through a match and be like, all right, uh, I missed 10% of my third shot drops, and when I did get it in, we won 80% of the time. I'm like, all right, that, that's, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then... During car rides to and from Chestnut Forks, yep, you know, it'd be me, John, Monica. Mm -hmm. They'd always have feedback, I'm like, "Oh, like, hmm, what if you collected shot level information?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, like, like, like location." And they're like, "Yeah, like, what's the best pattern to dink?" And I'm like, "Oh, that's, that's a really good idea." Yeah. So it's kind of evolved into a point where, you know, we were collecting granular data on matches, and I realized, oh, other people might be into this as well. Okay. And in the beginning, were you just watching videos and like doing i've done tally marks before <laughs> like how many drives did i hit how many thirds did i hit what was it effective like what did it look like yeah so i built like a very basic python script it looked like a like a like a 12 year old made it. if you looked at the interface like it was from like windows 98 or something and for lay people like myself what is a python script uh python's like a scripting language okay um, it, it it just looked like a program that was made 15 years ago okay but it helped me it helped me track mm -hmm. right um and I got enough interest from other people that were like, I want to do this for my match. Um, so, so I started posting on Reddit, on Facebook, things like that. Uh, I got, I got eventually a guy from California. Uh, he was like, yeah, I'm a software developer. Like we can make this app better. 
make it online and make it more accessible. Okay. So, you know, I've been working with Andrew for a year and a half now. Um, Peter, another guy from California, uh, as kind of like a, a product owner, mm -hmm. reaches out to other people and they're like, all right, like, what do you like about this? What's, what's an issue, et cetera. So the, are these your partners in the Pickle Mart? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very much. And yeah. are they also pickleball nerds like us? Of course. Good. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Got to keep it in the family. Oh yeah. Peter, Peter like built his own ball machine. It's, it's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we, we even have some like local folks that will help out occasionally. You know, James Roker has been doing some data entry for us. McNally has been doing some entry. Okay. Um, Jillian, local player, has been listening in, has some great ideas for the Pickle Mart. So. Very cool. Um, yeah, we, we like to make it accessible. Like anyone that wants to get involved, please. Mm -hmm. We uh, supported a high school physics class a couple weeks ago. Yeah. They, uh, the instructor is like, oh, I love pickleball and I want our students to do a project around it, but I don't know where to get data. And so he had their kids collect serve and return information using our web app Okay. Uh, for like a thousand serves of pro pickleball play. And, you know, like you can estimate how fast it went, mm -hmm. uh, how the rally ended, et cetera. And yeah, we like help them assemble the data and they're doing a project right now. That's very cool. Yeah. And I know we're going to talk in a little bit about some of the data you sent over on a pro match mm -hmm. that you had done. And I, I found it very eye opening that the percentage, the difference between a four five and a five Oh and a pro, the percentage isn't vast, but that tiny little percent means a ton of points won for oh, a pro. Oh yeah. Uh, people don't realize how a small increase or say a decrease in your error rate mm -hmm. can result in winning a much larger percentage of your matches. Like actually I have, I have an example here. Okay. This is good. All right. Say you miss 2% of your serves. Okay. Right? Uh, and we'll say as a team. Okay. Right? And as a team, you miss 8% of your returns. Pretty standard. Yep. Uh, and you miss, uh, let's say 20% of every other shot, which is pretty high, but okay. let's go with it. Mm -hmm. So if you played another team just like that, you'd, you'd win about half the time, right? Because you're identical. Okay. Yeah. Say you as a team reduce your service error rate to 1%, mm -hmm. your return error rate to 5%. Slight drop, mm -hmm. and you reduce your other shot error rate to just eighteen percent. You go from winning fifteen percent of best of three matches to what is it seventy six percent? Wow. Okay. So even though like the percentages don't sound large, yeah, like small improvements can really. Well, and it, it's when you think about return of serve and serve, just missing those two. I mean, you're immediately losing the point and or losing your serve in that particular situation. So those are huge. Um, Missing, well, I guess thirds are kind of the same way. If you're missing a third, every little error is kind of the same where you're handing over a serve and or giving the other team a point. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. So we played a pop-up yesterday. Yeah. God, everything's <laughs> moving so fast. The holidays have just been crazy. Um, and I know that I played singles for like two and a half, three hours the day before with Sam. And um, great games. But I showed up with my legs already toasted. And so by the second half of the pop-up, I was finding that my error percentage was going way up. And so therefore, I didn't feel like the people that I was playing um, were beating me. I felt like I was beating myself. Yep. And and it's nothing more frustrating than walking away with that feeling and, and not knowing what to do about it. You know, in, in that situation, I think for me, just getting a little bit more rest, not right. going out there already smoked on the legs. Uh, but as a pickle nerd, you can't help but want to show up and play. Um, but really breaking it down into the the finite details, I think, is really cool. I'm I'm glad you're doing that. So you, so you have the eye for pickle or the idea for the pickle mart. Yep. And um, so what is next, or how did 2023 look with it? And then what's kind of the goal for it in 2024? 2023 is a blast. Like, okay. To set the standards, this is started as a pet project and in some ways still is mm -hmm. um you know we offer services for people that want their match play broken down so like we, we have like a very small amount of revenue mm -hmm. um we also have a free tool people can use if they want to do it themselves um so that was one of our goals was like all right make this more accessible to other people okay got that done um we wanted to flesh out the reports that we're gonna go through mm -hmm. yep um and then near the end of 2023 moving into 2024 
we want to start aggregating data across matches. Like we're going to go and look at a specific match and look at the stats from that. Mm-hmm. But if you, Brian Green, have 20 matches logged, that is a more accurate representation of you as a player. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, people, yeah. people, I think, will find that very valuable. So more data is, is better. Duh. Would you say that the people reaching out to you that are wanting to use this, use this are, are pros? Are they higher level? Are they lower level players? Well, yeah, we got a mix. I mean, of course, like higher level players and pros uh, really care about performance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we've, we've had a couple pros reach out, and uh, I think there have been fruitful conversations. Very cool. Um, but I, I actually think in terms of helping people improve, I'd say the three out of four range players could really benefit from looking at their game because mm-hmm. there are some quick improvements you can make, especially around error percentages. You know, as you climb up to four, five, five, oh, like the quality of your third becomes even more important. Whereas when you're beginning, like get the ball in. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And you're putting pressure on, on people to, to make another shot. Yep. And at those lower levels, they may or may not. Okay. Okay. And then uh, while we're early in this as well, how, how would, let's say if a couple of the listeners are going, this makes sense, you know, uh, how do they find you? How do they get to log their games and, and get involved with Pickle Mart? Yeah. So uh, you can go to picklemart.com, P-K-L-M-A-R-T.com. Uh, we are going to rebrand next year. We're going to be Pickle Smart. There's going to be an S in there. Everything uh, else is staying the same. Okay. Uh, so depending when you listen to this, maybe you have to go there. Okay. Um, we're on Instagram as well, picklemart.analytics. Um, yeah, and uh, Alex's cell phone is, um, and you can just call him. Uh, SSN <laughs> is uh, 235. <laughs> oh, just, <laughs> just messing with you. All right, so we're going to look at a match now with, um, we have Catherine Parento, the Kawamoto sisters, and Paris Todd. So I take it the Kawamoto sisters were playing together against Paris Todd and Catherine? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, rock and roll. And so the the first thing, you've got a match summary going on here. Tell me just a little bit. Break this down for me as we go. Yep, so this first section, the match summary, it's setting the stage. It's providing context for the rest of the stats. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, first stat right here, 132 rallies, 12.2 shots per rally. I can tell you 12.2 is pretty high. Is it? Most pro matches are in the 10 to 11 range. Most like four O games are like in the eight to nine range. Um, That's a very small difference between pro. It seems like the pro rallies tend to go much longer in my brain when I'm watching it. That's fair. And you are probably watching a lot of the gold medal matches, which are generally much longer. Oh no, this geek watches them all, but all right, all right, I, I would right. agree. <laughs> yeah. So, and also I watch a lot of men's doubles, which I think would be slightly longer because there's so many dinks. Yep. Okay. Yep. Definitely lately. That's yeah. true. And a okay. lot of amateur plays use Franklin, right, which is easier to keep in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fair. Okay, so on average, the ball's going over the net six times. Uh, One, two. It's going over 12 times. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess you don't have to hit it twice to go yeah, over yeah, once. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's going over 12 times. So that makes sense then. So that's about right. Yep. And okay. so I just see this. I'm like, all right, like, these rallies are pretty long. Like, I, I'm we're probably going to pay more attention to the dink section. Mm-hmm. Um. This player impact metric, uh, people ask for this. I don't think there's a ton of insight. But the idea here is that you can see who is having more of an impact on the game um, as a function of time. And generally speaking, if you're getting targeted, uh, your impact score is probably going to go up, which okay. makes sense. You're hitting a lot more balls. Okay. Um, so like in this particular one we're looking at, it looks like Catherine and Paris both were hitting more than Jade and Jackie. Yeah, and I think they, they were actually going after um, Jade more in this match. Okay. Yep. Yep. That would make sense because she hit more balls. Okay. Yep. Yeah, because when I was looking at this, it, it it was really hard to understand exactly where we're going. And so we have um, the 10, 20, 30, 40, the left side versus the right side. W- what are we looking at there in this? Yep. So the, le- the y-axis is uh, the actual value is pretty arbitrary. What we care about is the players relative to each other. Okay. Yep. Um, and then on the x-axis is, you know, rally number one, rally number two, et cetera. Okay. Yep. And so the idea is that as your line increases, that means, all right, you're having more of a positive impact on the game. Mm-hmm. Um, granted, if you get iced out and you don't see the ball, 
your, your impact is going to be really low on this graph, which might not necessarily represent the impact that you actually had. Yeah, because there could be a lot of off-the-ball movement. You're not necessarily touching the ball, but you're putting a lot of pressure on exactly. the other team. Yep, especially okay. like in pro mix, for example. Oh, yeah, big yep. time. Yep. Okay, okay. Um, and then below that, it's just a summary table that explains the inputs into what caused the metric to go up and down. Okay. Yep, so for example, you can see that Paris Todd hit 40 balls that were not returned by the cow motos. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Um, so those would be like winners. Winners or just a shot that resulted in an error from the opponent. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So any ball that didn't come back. Mm -hmm. uh, assists are shots where you hit it, your opponents hit it, and then your partner hits an unreturned shot. Mm -hmm. um, and then errors, pretty self-explanatory. And then the number of shots that each player hit. And again, you can see that in this case, Jade hit... 449 shots, Jackie hit 363. Okay. Yep. So they were definitely, definitely going after Jade in this match. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And then we're going to get down into, like, uh, you call it the shot heat map. Yep. Just another way of, of looking at where players were targeting and where most shots were hit. Okay. And so you're seeing a lot of, like, um, to me, I was surprised at how many balls went long. On ah, this. this is the tricky part. These dots represent point of contact. Ah, yes. There yes. you go. Yep. Okay. Okay. So not so the ones that are out are not necessarily balls that were winners, uh, but that's where they hit the ball. Correct. Think so, of like a return of serve. You'd probably be behind the baseline. And thirds. Yep. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. And if you look at this, you actually might be like, all right, well, Jade's a lefty and Jackie's a righty, but like on the heat map, looks like they got the same number of balls. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually did not unwind the stack a lot of time. Hmm. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, that's something we should add to the reports. Yeah. That well, probably because Paris hits a lot of drives, and and I guess Catherine could probably do the same. But I looked ahead and I had some cheats. It seems like Catherine <laughs> was drop, dropping a lot more. I've no. Yeah, her drop is lethal. Why? Why do you think they weren't under, unwinding the stack? Uh, for them as a pairing, I've, I've seen them do that multiple times. I think mm -hmm. they're actually pretty comfortable. Okay. Back ends middle. So either either side, they're cool. And yeah. they both have two handers, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's a weapon. Yep. Okay. So then you've got your shot type frequencies. This to me is where um, it's it's really eye opening, and that what are the what are the things that you need to practice to get better, and you need to be able to dink, and you need to be able to get the ball over and into the kitchen and transition. Yes. Yeah, that transition zone percentage, people constantly underestimate how big it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is pretty standard. And in fact, 28.7% is actually a little on the low side. Okay. Yep. Now, I before I had uh, Dave McNally on, we went and drilled for a little bit up at my courts. Nice. And um, one of the things we worked on, he showed me this fantastic drill. So you guys should all try it at home. It is, um, Dave was on the baseline. I'm up. Uh, at the kitchen line on the other side of the court. So Dave's on the left side of the court. I'm on the right side of the court. He hits a drive at me, and I have to block it back to behind him to the right-hand side of the court. To And so he hits a drive, and then he has to be in transition to drop it back into the kitchen Ooh. to me. And then we finish the point out skinny singles. Nice. First person to 11. It was so much fun, and it was super eye-opening because what I thought I really need to work to work on was not it. I mean, yes, I do still need to work on a backhand volley, but the transition was huge. I was having a hard time getting to the kitchen line against him. And I'm going, hmm, well, if I can't get to the kitchen line, I'm not going to win many points. Who cares what my volley looks like if I can't get points? Yep. So, yeah, that, that was a pretty eye-opening stat. Yep. Now, the serve is only, what, 8.2% of the overall shots? Is that what we're looking at here? Oh, uh, let's see here. Yes, that, that is right. Um, yep, and the return would be the same. Yep. Uh, I'd say for lower-level play, those numbers are much larger. Um, okay. Like, I think serving and returning is actually a bigger factor in, in 3 out of 4 level play, for example. Okay. Because they consist of a higher percentage of the shots. Yeah, yep. that makes sense. Yep. That makes sense. And you're probably getting a lot shorter of a return, which could set up a lot of points as well Yep. in lower-level play. Yep. Okay. For sure. And so the uh, the serve and return breakdown section, which is next, mm -hmm. um, if you are missing serves or are missing returns, can be really helpful. In this case, 
Uh, let's see here. So you'll notice for the little uh, tables here, you can actually scroll. There are more columns. Okay. Yep. There we go. Yep. So, for example, let's see. Jackie hit 25 serves this match. 4% um, of them uh, resulted, so one of them, resulted in a return error. So where are you seeing this yeah. at in here? I see this. this oh, is yeah, that. so, like, if you actually go on there. Oh, yeah, there yeah, we yeah. go. Okay. Yep, yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And so for this match, I, I, the serving and returning metrics, I think, are not super helpful. Mm -hmm. However, if I was a player and say I was, I don't know, say I was Paris, if you go down to the returns visualize section, mm -hmm. you can look at every return that she hit. The dot is the point of contact. Um, and then the arrow points to where the third shot was hit. Okay. Um, but if you actually go and you see like some of them have a little red circle around them. Mm -hmm. Those are errors that she made. Uh. And you can go in on the graphic and actually tap the dot. Uh -huh. And uh, let's see if we can catch it here. It'll actually show the replay of that exact moment. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's super cool. So if, if me as an amateur loaded my stuff in, would I get that yes, level sir. of, okay, all the way? Yes, That's sir. That's very cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Coaches love that too. Yeah. Because stats provide a picture. However, if you want to know why you're missing the return, maybe it's because you're putting it in a high-risk spot, or maybe it's because your mechanics are bad. Yeah. But for that, you need, you, need, you need to be able to watch it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, why did, I, why did I hit that one long or short or, or whatever happened? Maybe absolutely missing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw the, uh, do you follow the memes of pickleball? Of at all? Yes, they're so good. <laughs> and if you're not following them, memes of pickleball on Instagram. But they were showing, like, the top, 10 worst shots of the year of 2023. Oh, there's some whiffs, weren't there? Oh, it's yeah, like yeah. some whiffs, some shanks, and like pro-level pickleball. I was like, whoa, I didn't even think that happened. <laughs> I love that account. Yeah, they're really, really good. And now this return visu visualization, mm -hmm. as well as the serve visualization, I think is really interesting because they're – they're kind of all over the place as far as where they're placing the serves, where they're placing the returns. It's not like, okay, we're going to return middle or we're going to return to this person. It seems like, like, um, on Jade Kawamoto, she serves from the same spot on both sides and for the most part kind of hits it down the middle. Yeah. I, what I found from, from basically every level is that people are not thinking about where they put their serve. Mm -hmm. They're getting it in. Um, and the analysis that we've done shows that, like, that, yeah, just get the serve in. Yeah. Um, in singles, it gets a little more nuanced. For sure. But in doubles, get the serve in. But but, you, mm -hmm. Well, I've heard a lot of pros saying that even in doubles now, like, go after your serve. It, it helps to score points. Sure. I, I guess I was speaking more on location. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, meaning hit it hard. Okay, yeah, yeah. And deep. Right? Yep. Um, although, I've started to mess around with, like, serving in people's backhands and... Mm -hmm. But, like, if it puts you at risk of missing the serve, uh, probably not worth it. Well, I was in Wilmington this past week, and I played with this dude named Steve Scala down there, who's one of the best or better players in Wilmington. And young guy, super fast, hits the ball super hard. Um, but I noticed right away that he wasn't attacking on his backhand. Like, within the first couple of points, and I was like, all right, well, let me just test this. So I started hitting all the returns to his backhand to mm -hmm. keep him away from the net. And immediately we started scoring points and catching up to these guys. Now we didn't beat him in the end because I still need to get better. But that one little nugget of just noticing something and then trying to return to backhand return, make him hit backhands yep. was the whole goal of the thing. And so I think these maps are, would be interesting to see like how effective did I do what I wanted to do after the fact. Yep. Uh, to your point about actually attacking the backhand on the return, we did mm -hmm. a, paper probably like eight months ago at this point mm -hmm. i tried to like figure out all right, what is the ideal return um and when you're returning from the right side if you can consistently put that shot down the line and make the opponent's left side player hit a backhand or really move their feet to try and hit a run around forehand mm -hmm. that's a good return yeah good outcomes yeah yeah for yes. sure now also when you're trying to unwind the stack that's the best place to put it as well 
right? Yep. Oh, it drives me crazy that people don't take advantage of this. Yeah, okay. Unwinding the stack, if you know your opponents are going to switch, just, like, try and serve it outside. Give yourself some margin, but, like, make them cover more court. Why not? Yeah, for sure. And I, Even in tournament play, I see people just, like, I'm just going to push the ball in, even though I know they're going to unwind. Yeah. Like, just take, like, the 3% chance of you winning because they mess up while they're crossing, right? For sure. For sure. Um, yeah, this in the returns, I think you can see Jade actually has a little bit of a pattern here where she was typically going a bit to the opponent's right side player. Okay. Yep. Yep, yep. Um, so that looks like it may have been purposeful. For other players, they might just be trying to get it in. Now, it, it's also interesting. So when I went to Costa Rica and I was um, training with Kyle Yates, he talked a lot about return and serve to middle. Mm. Return, serve, middle, return, serve, middle. Um Simply because you make less errors, number one, as a lower level player. Um, but secondly, it, it, like I know in singles it takes away angles on it, but in doubles it, it creates a situation where um, you know, you're know you going to have basically the left-hand side guy, as long as they're a righty, taking that third shot drop. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's kind of what they were doing there. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff I, get, I will say is like very player-dependent. Mm -hmm. Like some people love as a left side player coming over and taking that forehand drop. Oh yeah. Other people not so much. But in the middle, some people fight over it. You know. Yeah. 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 That is definitely true. If that's happening though, that's a you need to have a conversation with your your partner. Yep. Because uh, yeah, I I know if I'm playing on the left side and it's anywhere close to middle, even if it's coming to your left foot. I'm probably oh. going to take that shot. Give me that Brian Green forehand drive. <laughs> That's so nice. You know it's coming. <laughs> oh, it's a staple. So the next little section we have is, a, what, a third shot breakdown? Mm -hmm. This is where things get fun. Okay. Yep. Uh, so first graph, just showing drive to drop ratio of each player. What are they going for? Mm -hmm. Catherine, a lot of drops. Yeah. A lot of drops. Yeah, yeah. When I was looking at this before, I was actually shocked because I thought she would hit more drives than that. Oh, yeah. No, in reports, I have I think Catherine has one of the best drops in Pro Pickle, period. Wow. No question. Okay. Um, but if we wanted to be like, all right, how effective was that drop? We could go to the third shot performance table below. Mm -hmm. And you can see here that Catherine hit 27 drops. All right. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. She had an error rate of 3.7%, so she missed one. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they won the rally 44.4% of the time, which while you're serving is pretty good. Okay. Uh, most pros, I think, went around 40%, maybe 38, 40% of rallies when they're serving. So as long as you're above 40%, you're, you're happy with that. You're probably doing something right. Yeah, because as the server, you have the immediate disadvantage since they're gaining the kitchen line first. Yep. Okay. And if you go all the way to the right, this is my favorite metric, it's the percent of times that led to dinking. So when Catherine hit a third shot drop, her team got to the kitchen and hit dinks two thirds of the time. Yeah, sixty six point seven, right? Yep. Yeah, which is that's a that's a pretty good metric right there. So if you're walking into a match and going, we got these guys at the kitchen, mm -hmm. so all we need to do is get up there. It, you're hitting effective drops, and then you could go back and again analyze it if you put your match in, and you can see whether you did what you were trying to do. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. It's it's really good stuff, man. Yeah, and so you can you can do that for everyone's drive and drop. You know, getting to the kitchen might not necessarily be your goal. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know that you're you're a little bit of a dog at the kitchen. You know. Yep. So drive, create some chaos, maybe. Oh, play Brian Green style. Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, does it, it's just so funny. So let's let's go the opposite direction now. And um, Jade hit the most drives out of everyone, right? Am I seeing that correctly? Yep. She hit twenty drives. Okay, so now let's look at her shot performance. All right, she she only missed one. Good drive. So drive errors are typically higher, so that's good. Um, and they won fifty five percent of the time. Wow. Yeah, they did well. They did okay. well when she drove. Um, they didn't get to the kitchen line as often, but that's who cares if you're winning the rally. Yeah, for sure. Well, you're making it ugly, which is you're not trying to get to the kitchen line. Yep. And if you wanted to see how, like where she hitting the drives from, you can go to the section below third shots visualized. Okay. Yep. So here we go, Jade. Um, it looks like she was actually taking a lot of her drives cross court, which is a little unusual. Um, perhaps she was catching the unwinding stack in some cases. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, perhaps she was targeting a specific player. Um, yeah, she really did. Uh, like most of them went cross court, which is that's awesome. Okay, but also notice all the all the dots that are like inside the baseline are mm. basically they're all orange. Mm-hmm. So the shorter returns are the ones that she was driving. Yeah, yep. because the longer ones are, yeah, that, that's a cool visu- visualization as well. Yeah, people will often see that their win rate when they drive the ball is higher. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you should be hitting more drives. Okay, I'm right? glad you said that because I was about to go, wow, look, no more third shot drops. Because you're what you're doing is the easy balls you're hitting drives on mm-hmm. and the harder ones you're dropping. Yeah. Uh, who's to say if you didn't drop the easier ones, your win rate wouldn't also be high. I don't know. That's an analysis worth doing. I think in general, short returns should be attacked with the drive. For sure. But that doesn't necessarily mean like a deep return should be driven. Yeah. Yep. No, no. And unless you're just not confident in your drop, you know, and, and I always like to add that in because as a four or five level player, I have moments that where I'm going, I, I can't get a drop into the kitchen. They're either too high. I'm hitting them into the net and I'm going to go to old trusty drive. Cause I know I can hit 80% of those. Oh, well, against the wind, especially. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be driving a high percentage of the time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Kitchen rally. Yep. Let's All right. go. All right. So when players get up to the kitchen, let's see what happens. Um, in this match, uh, it looks like about 44% of rallies went to the kitchen. It's mm-hmm. pretty high. Yeah. Big part of the game. All right. So the first section looks at dinking. Um, you can see that Catherine and Paris hit 243 dinks. Jade and Jackie hit 264. It's a lot of shots. Now, what I'm interested in is that Jade and Jackie, it looks like, are, are trying to dink with Catherine versus Paris, which mm-hmm. I'm not super familiar, but I think it in my brain it would have been the opposite and that Catherine's a really good dinker. Yeah, I think I think Jade got caught up in like the cross court dinking pattern a decent amount. Okay. Yeah. Um, which which might have let Catherine hit a few more. Okay. Um and I think Catherine was playing the left side for most of this match. So mm-hmm. she was able to take all the ones in the middle too. Yep. Yep. Uh let's see here. If we look at the error rates, um Catherine and Paris actually won the dink battles by if you just look at the error rates. They they had they had two dink errors the whole match as compared to eleven. For Jade and Jackie. That's insane. Yeah. That's two dink errors out of uh, 243 dinks. <laughs> yep. So that's a nine rally difference. They only won the match by, let me see here. They won the match by eight rallies. Right? Wow. That that That's a big part of the difference right there. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that also to me says that, again, like, we're looking at what are the things you need to work on first, and, and dinks are super important. Even though I might have challenged you if you just walked in the room and said you need to practice your dinks more because the game is getting so fast, it seems like the speed up and make it a little ugly has been more popular this past year because of paddles, balls, etc. Yeah, and we'll, we'll look at some of the speed up numbers later too. Okay, yeah. very cool. But yeah, if, if I'm the Cow Motors from this match, I would want to replay those dink errors to see exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Well, the the difference between 2 and 11 is huge. I mm-hmm. mean, if you're looking at half of those getting a point, uh, then, I mean, that's five additional points you're losing by right there. Mm-hmm. Hmm, okay. Yep, and then you can get a sense of people if they're going straight, if they're going out wide with their dinks, et cetera. That's what the, the dink direction table is for. Okay. Um, what we do want to add is kind of another section for patterns that evolve you know cross court cross court inside foot Mm -hmm. i want to know how effective that was okay that's something we have data for but it's not shown in the report okay and something that um a lot of 40 plus players have started to ask for so if we got out of this particular one and i just asked you like what are the 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 dink situations that you feel work best after seeing a lot of these reports is it constantly going cross court? Is it going straight ahead? Is it? I've heard in men's doubles that a lot of guys like to dink to the middle now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, it's so dependent on level of play. Okay, that, that's the answer for a lot of things. But well, let, let's just say pro. Like right now, we're talking about a pro match. Yeah, um, pro match. I, I, for the most part, people aren't going to miss dinks, so they're 
trying to move you around and be very effective at creating some sort of chaos. Yep, trying to create opportunities. Correct. Yep, trying to get a, a return ding that's just a little bit too high. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, always left side player's backhand mm -hmm. is is safe. It's safe. Yeah. As long as you can keep it short, very few pros have a backhand speed up off the bounce that's effective. Yeah. So what we see is when people get in trouble, uh, that's a good spot. If you're stretched out wide and you're hitting a backhand dink, resetting middle has become very popular, especially in a lot of the gold medal matches. Yeah. Uh, like JW, Dylan taking on the Johns. You see that pattern quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll go middle because they know if they speed up from middle, it's so easy to cover every angle. For sure. Yep. Um, yeah, so it really is dependent on the matchup. Uh, you see a lot of patterns, and it's something we still want to look more into. Okay. Okay. And then... Is there, and I know we're going a little off topic here, but it's just like things are popping in my head, how to help the amateurs that mm -hmm. are listening to this. Um, you know, if you're a, a 4 player, you know, uh, are you looking to drop middle? Are you looking to drop to the outside? Are you, it, do you ever think about that? Or should you just think about making your shot? I think if you can get your third shot drop error rate, below, I'm going to pick an arbitrary number, but say below 15%, mm -hmm. then I think you should start focusing on location. Okay. Yep. Um, player's backhand on the outside is the default for four or five plus level play. Yeah. That is, that's half my strategy when I play. That's my favorite spot. Yeah. It's, it's so safe. Left hand players back, backhand or to their, to their left foot. Yes. If they're a righty. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, and if you have plenty of lefty, you know, go to, go to their outside backhand. Right? Do, doesn't that throw everything off of the lefties just <sighs> mess me up, especially in singles too, because you got to change your patterns opposite to everything you're nor normally doing. Yep. And that's the one that plays the left side a good amount. My speed up spots against the lefty are flipped and it always screws me up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Your backhand roll down the line from the left is really, really good. Work in progress. Really good. But against a lefty, like. Most of them are sitting backhand, and it's like it's not a good idea. You know, <laughs> I got to take a little more middle. But, okay. Um, back to the report here. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. So, if you look at the speed up section, which we're just talking about, mm -hmm. you can see where every player sped the ball up from, uh, and if they were successful. So the chart or the the table summarizes what happened. Uh, so let's take a look here. Mm -hmm. All right. So Paris sped the ball up a lot. We'll focus on her. She sped the ball up 40 times this match. She's pretty trigger happy. Yeah. Um, and that represents over a quarter of dinks that she received. She then proceeded to speed up. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 20, yeah, 27% is what they're showing up here. Yep. And so... She won the rally half the it, time. She was playing left side or right side? I think they mixed it up a bit. I think she was generally playing... Let me see. I think she's generally would, playing right. Yeah, she's playing right. Okay, so she's speeding up possibly from the air. Not This doesn't break it down to off the bounce or in the air, right? 2024 improvement. Let's go. Because <laughs> <laughs> that'd be interesting to know if, like, I, I felt like the left side player would speed up off the bounce a lot more than the right side player. And I only say that because you're, it's just, in my brain, that's how it would work. Mm -hmm. And the ball drops and you're using that forehand to flick it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, you can go into this visual and start clicking the dots and seeing what she's doing. Yep. Um, yep. There's yeah. just so much to be learned from this. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's like a rabbit hole. Yeah, really. I could see that. I mean, but she won half the rally. She sped up. Yep. Uh, and then 15% of the time, the ball's neutralized and they went back to dinking. Mm -hmm. And they lost 35% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes those balls that she sped up are kind of sitters, right? Yep. And sometimes they're, they're truly neutral balls. Um, and so when you see a 50% win rate, that doesn't necessarily mean you should be speeding the ball up more. Uh, that means when you saw an opportunity to attack, okay, you were generally successful. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, the, so let's say you're trying to create shots as well. You could be bringing that percentage down with doing some things that what I call are not smart. Mm -hmm. um, but at the pro level, you know, a lot of times there's a thought behind it. Yep. And in the 4-0, you're like, I don't want to dink. Whack. <laughs> well, what's interesting is if you look at where she put her speed ups, uh, they weren't down the line. Right? A lot of people like catching people with a speed up down the line. Mm -hmm. Now, in this case, she went like at her opponent's 
kind of chicken wing spot. Yep, that's right. Yep. Right shoulder, right hip. Right. Mm-hmm. Which, in this case, it could be... A, actually, that could be a chicken wing, depending on who was in front of her, if it was Jade or Jackie. Correct. Yep, and, and that's where, like, actually watching the film becomes really helpful. The other thing is, like, I mean, she's really speeding up uh, cross-court a lot. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's wild. Yeah. And then the the last section we got here is the errors breakdown. Mm-hmm. And so this is where I think people will find the most value. You can look at what your error rate was across the match. And if you look at the errors visualized, you can literally click on each dot and see, all right, like, uh, that's why I made that one. That's why I made that one. From the visual itself, you can see, all right, like I missed them all under the net. I missed them all along. Or I just missed a bunch in the transition zone. That's what the, the different colors represent, different mm-hmm. shot types. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see here that it looks like Jackie missed a lot into the net. Um, Paris and Catherine were actually hitting a decent number of balls long. Most people will say that areas that are missed long are generally better than balls into the net, right? Because your opponent has a chance to actually hit it. Yeah, I'm really surprised. It looks like Jackie and Jade both hit a bunch of balls into the net. And mm-hmm. that's, um, uh, that is a recipe for losing. Yep, yeah, they don't, they don't do that very often. Yeah. <laughs> wow, we're, I mean, if you just look at the two different charts, I mean, Catherine hit a couple into the net, Paris did as well, but yeah, Jackie and Jade probably hit twice as many mm-hmm. into the net and thus losing the match, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that. I'm sure that's part of the difference. Yeah. Interesting. So the overall error rates for pro players are much less than you and I. Let's mm-hmm. go the 4-0, the 4-5, the 5-0. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say by studying this, it just looks at me, and i, I got to learn to just make more balls. Yeah, easier said than done, but yeah. Yeah. Now, the, the interesting thing is that you as you're getting to higher-level play, the – Balls that are coming back at you are going to be more aggressive, more spin, hit harder in Mm -hmm. better spots. So it's harder to make more balls. But um, what advice would you give to like a 3 5 4 0 player who's trying to get to the 4 5 level? Yeah. Based Uh, on analytics. Yeah. I would say high percentage balls, number one. Okay. Stop missing serves, returns, and thirds specifically. Okay. Okay. Um, and then always test your opponent's backhand, especially their backhand dink. Always test it. For 90-plus percent of players, it's their weaker dink spot. Not everyone. Got to be careful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think those two rules alone, I don't know, maybe they can put your duper up like maybe 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3. That's pretty yeah. nice. I, I would, Yeah, <laughs> I would definitely agree. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, another improvement for 2024, forehands versus backhands. I know people are always asking about that. Ah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could break that down, that would be cool. Because mm-hmm. if you're missing, like, 75% of your backhands, you know, I got to work on that. Yes, Big sir. Time. Yep. Big time. All right, so let's jump out of this match. I think this was really eye-opening as far as the, the pro-level game. But you also sent me over a couple of uh, very cool things about, like, your partner getting targeted. Yeah. And what I – this – really touched home for me in that the last tournament that I played with this year was with Broker. Mm -hmm. All right. Broker is, he looks like the better player. He is the better player. And as we're playing in these open, uh, we were playing open down in Richmond. um, The guys figured out with like two thirds of the way through the first game, we got to go after Brian. All right. So at that point, I'm, basically doing everything I I can to try to keep the ball into play, but I'm getting 90% of the balls. Mm -hmm. All right. What can James then do to help me out? Yep. Yeah. It's a perfect scenario. Yeah. And this situation arises a lot. Yeah. Even in rec play, which, uh, you know, it's kind of annoying, but um, people are, oh, I always hear people bitching, like, I didn't see the ball. Like, how am I even supposed to play this game? All right. Like, let's see what you do have in your control. Yeah. I'm not saying that, what we're about to show you is going to like prevent you from getting iced out or being targeted. No, I mean, it, but it's going to help a little bit, right? For sure. No, I mean, I went through these slides and they're really good. So this first slide says, I, I've tried taking more court. What else can I do? Let's focus on where you're placing your shots is mm-hmm. the solution. So what, is, what does that mean? Your third shot drive you're, you're going cross court with? Yeah. So I think 
James Burke, that's a great example. He has a ni- really nice drive. Yeah. He has a nice drop, too. But he yeah, has a yeah. really nice drive. Um, and if he takes that drive down the line, your opponents are going to block, right? Mm-hmm. And generally, when you block the ball, it comes back to where it came from. Yeah. So he is more likely to see the subsequent fifth shot. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, yeah, because if the, unless you're just hitting shitty drives, and then they can block it in different directions, which is not good. Yep. But let's say you have a good drive. Yes. Then yep. it's most likely coming right back to you. Yep, and it increases the chance that you hit the next ball from what it looks like 57.7% to 65.2%. Okay. Again, not a huge jump, but we're playing the percentages here. Okay. Yep. Um, and then the next one says a few more shots to think about. Yep. So we talked about the drive. Now let's talk about the third shot drop. Uh, whereas the drive, you want to be taking it down the line if you want to see the next ball. Mm-hmm. The drop, if you can hit it decently well, you generally want to be taking cross court. Okay. Because if you can imagine hitting a fourth shot off of a good third where it's at your feet, mm-hmm. it, you have more court to work with if you take it back cross court. For sure. Yep. Yeah. And, and if they try and take it down the line, there's a good chance that you... Ryan Green can step in and whack that with your forehand because that's a tough ball to keep down. Correct. Yep. Correct. No, and and actually I was thinking about this as, as I was looking through it, and your percentages I, I think might even be a little low if you're hitting a good third shot drive cross court. Like most of the time the other team's going to bail out by chipping it back right over to you. Mm-hmm. And then it's just about resetting and or speeding up if they hit a high one. Yep. Um, so that that's a – to maybe even a more effective way than hitting a drive down the line if you have a good drop. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, and then finally, when you're speeding the ball up, if you sometimes you only really have like a small number of spots to go with, but if you have some decisions to make, mm-hmm. and you're like, should I speed this up? Should I whack it cross court? Should I whack it down the line? Um, obviously, like sometimes you're picking a spot on a player to go for, mm-hmm. but if you speed up cross court and your opponent's block, that block's going to your partner. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, if you want to avoid your partner getting iced out or getting hit so many balls, I would say consider speeding up down the line a little more often. Yeah. Yep. Make sure to tell your partner before you start doing this so that they're ready for it, though. That's right. Yeah. Um, yes. I recently watched a video mm-hmm. on the triangle mm-hmm. in pickleball, and it was really eye opening. I never thought about it or seen a visualization of it, but. Just know that, like, when you're speeding up at the kitchen, it's most likely going to end in a triangle. And so if you're speeding up cross court, you need to let your partner know that you're going to be doing this because uh, most of the balls are going to go back to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're ready, it's super effective because, like, let's say if you're speeding up two right-handers, mm-hmm. uh, I'm on the right, and I speed up to the left. Whoop, uh, slap the microphone. <laughs> Uh, they're going to come back, and then you have a wide-open forehand if you're ready for it, Mm -hmm. for the most part. It's going to be really hard for them to hit it behind you if you're positioned right on the court. Yep. Um, So I I think that's something that a a lot of people should really start thinking about is, you know, where they're actually placing their speed-ups and what they're trying to do with it. Yep, and and communicating it to your partner. For sure. Because you need your partner to be sitting forehand or backhand, and Mm -hmm. their decision, like you're saying, is based on what you're going to do. Correct. Yep. Correct. So when I hit a drive, most of the time, I tell all my secrets on this, anybody that wants to do it, like, but most of the time I'm trying to stripe it right down the middle. Nice. To just over the net, right down the middle. That way a decision has to be made. Does the left side guy take it Mm -hmm. or does, who's going to get the ball? Yep. Right. Um, But with that decision being made, most likely the next shot is going to come back to my partner. Yeah, especially if you're hitting it from the outside of the court, right? If you're hitting it from the middle to the middle, yeah, you can get the next ball. Yeah, okay. It's a decent number of times. But I see what you're saying. Yep. Yeah, and, but again, just with the triangle thing, mm-hmm. if I'm hitting it to the middle, it's going to probably go back to my partner. Yep. So that's something that I should talk with my partner about. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. I just think everyone can benefit from looking at their play, number one, like watching video. Even though I know it's hard at times, I know that I hate watching myself play, uh, but I learn something every time from it. Yeah, so uh, on that note, we're actually creating highlight reels for people. Okay. Um, which, you know, will be automated. You know, like, we have all this data. Mm-hmm. We can put together, we can write a script to put together highlight reels for people, which I think people will like, really enjoy. But we also might put together 
low light reels are like compilations of all your backhand dink errors, mm -hmm. which I think will also be that that will actually help you improve. Yeah. One will make you feel good. The other will help you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So and, and that's interesting. Your low light reel, if you're effectively see, that would actually be cool if you're sending me that and it's all my backhand dinks, I can go, OK, I missed most of them when I got pulled really, really wide and or I missed it when I had to go from a backhand to a forehand or I mean, you can really kind of look at it and see what you need to improve. Or maybe I missed a lot when I went down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Wow. It's good stuff. Well, uh, if you guys are really enjoying this, I'd love for you to like and subscribe to the Pickle Pulse. Tell your friends, tell your grandma, tell anybody who is out there on the courts and playing the best game in the world. And uh, I appreciate you guys sticking with us for one more wonderful episode. Anything else for the people out there, Alex? Nah, I think I'm good. So you can find Alex on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You can find him at picklemart.com. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe pickle smart soon. That's right. But it's PKL. PKL, that's right. Yep. All right. Maybe getting some more hats soon. For nice. All the locals here. <laughs> Keep you in the loop. Yes, and we're going to have some t shirts coming out as well. So uh, thanks for your time, buddy. Thank you, Brian, for having me. It's yep. fun. We'll see you soon, dude.